first thing, if you're taking notes, this side belongs to you. The other side comes at 11 o'clock. So if you've written that down, sorry. Take my ethics class, and that'll pertain to you. OK, here's what I want to do. We started this whole semester with, uh, with inquiry, with trying to figure out certain things. Uh, and the first thing that we try and figure out in intro is metaphysics. What kind of things are really real? And for most of us, that's irrelevant. And my concern is when you come to this class the first time and I start sharing this stuff and I share string theory and wormholes and you go, what does that have to do with us? Well, it's part of philosophy. It's how we introduce you to what we call critical thinking or examining the world around us. <clears throat> so the first thing I shared with you is metaphysics. What kinds of things are really real? Physical objects, obviously. How about thoughts, ideas, intuitions, insights, epiphanies? Those are important, too, because we relate to one another on that level as well as on the material, physical world. And then I told you that a subset of metaphysics was ontology. Well, what kind of things are really real? And that's important that we look at that as well. And then this week, we started to talk about epistemology. How do we know stuff? What's the difference between true belief and false belief? What's the difference between knowledge and opinion? What's the difference between the truth and not supposed truth? So when we start with epistemology, with knowledge, and trying to figure out what we know and how we go about knowing it, <clears throat> last week I introduced you to two tools. One is logic. And we had two forms of logic. We had deductive logic that follow formulas, and then we had inductive logic, which is what most of us use. We try and put samples together and come up with what we think is the right information. And then today, we not only want to talk about that, but I want to talk about foundationalists and constructivists and specifically about empiricists, people who <clears throat> say that we're hardwired to be sensory receivers. We receive things through our eyes, our nose, touch, smell, and that can give us information about the world, whether it can lead us to the truth, we don't know. The rationalists say that reason can lead us to the truth, and that's the foundation of deduction and induction. At this stage in the semester, what I want to do is I want to introduce you to dialogue and discussion. So in my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question, and there's no such thing as a wrong answer. We're just thinking together. This is really important that we start to develop this habit. And I purposely introduce it to you early in the semester, and I remind everybody that I have the two fingers. So I'm hoping I can cajole you. What does cajole mean? Anybody know what cajole means? kind of get you into it with me. Because I don't judge you based on what you say. I mean, we're just we're looking for answers. We're just trying to explore parameters. Uh, and I'll give you a quick example of that. At the, end of, at the end of this semester, I have what's called an exit interview to figure out how I can make the class better. How many of you have I had before? So you've been in an exit interview with me. One day, we had uh, Caleb. He was a baseball player. And uh-oh, uh the Caleb. And, and we were talking about capital punishment. And in capital punishment, one of the problems is 11% of the people we found guilty, it turns out, weren't guilty. You can't execute someone who's innocent for a crime they didn't commit. Justice requires fairness. Well, we know 11% of them were innocent. We don't know how many innocent people we executed. We only found out after the fact. And so. One of the questions in the dialogue at that class is always, so how many of you are for capital punishment? And a lot of people are until I point out 11% are innocent. How can you kill the not guilty? And, and I said, so those of you who are for capital punishment, what do you do with, with the 11% that aren't guilty? And Caleb said, collateral damage. What's collateral damage mean? It's a really bright thing what he said. Collateral damage means no intent to hurt, but people get hurt. You walk across the street and get run over by a car. No one stands there and goes, well, some people do. You know, hit me, hit me, hit me. Collateral damage. And when he, when he, said, that, when he, said, when he said that, I thought, okay, okay, that's an interesting idea, but you're still killing the innocent. And the more I thought about it, I thought life is all about collateral damage. How many of you have had something happen to you and there was no intent on your part to have it happen to you? And it was damaging. One way or another, it happens. Life is filled with collateral damage. And I thought, that is really bright. <laughs> so at the end of the class, at the exit interview, oh, I'm going to forget his name now. Anyway, we're sitting there. And I said, any questions for me? And he said, what did you learn from us? 
See, I learn from you every semester. And I said, collateral damage. And of course, Caleb's in there with me. I can't tell you how much that impressed me that he said that. I had never thought of that before, and it's absolutely right. It's not a justification for killing the innocent, but it's exactly what happens when it comes to situations like that. The reason for telling you that, that's what happens when we talk to one another, when we have dialogue. That being said, let me do a short little review for you, and then I want to get to what I really want to talk about today, and then I'll go through a few more deeper understanding of this, because frankly, this is the bulk of your quiz, but I want to get you into this. So philosophy. If philosophy is the rational attempt. Notice we emphasize reason here. The West is always emphasizing reason. Rational attempt, I'm sorry, to formulate, understand, and answer fundamental questions, then what is rational? OK, we had that last week, deductive, inductive logic. Those are tools. They work, but they're limited in their application. What if logic doesn't apply to a situation? For example, 3.12 in the morning, a mother finds out or it, it realizes, it comes to her that her child half a world away has just been wounded in combat. And then the next morning, the telegram comes and says, their time, 3.12, your son was wounded in combat. How did she know that? Do you ever get those ideas where you get, you call someone, they say, wow, I was just thinking of calling you. Where's the logic in that? Well, there is no logic in that. Now, there's some people who are so dedicated to reason and logic say, well, on some plane, there must be the ability to transmit thoughts across distances. Well, I believe that. That's the fifth dimension. But I can't prove it, and I certainly can't prove it with logic. Not yet. Maybe at some point we can prove that. So I taught you about logic because logic is a, it's a tool, but it has limitations. Okay, That's one of the ways maybe we can answer fundamental questions. The question about fundamental questions is, what is fundamental? Is it absolute truths, or are they relative? Are they determined by culture? So I asked you, I think it was on, uh, this is Thursday and Tuesday, how many of you believe in absolute truths? And I use beauty as the example. You were the only one who raised your hand, which means he's the only one that's right. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> how do we know those things? How do we know that there's an absolute out there, like the existence of God? How do we know that? How do we prove that? And there's been people throughout the centuries, philosophers have tried to prove that. And they come up with proofs for it. Does anyone know why 1 plus 1 equals 2? Right, because 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's what they taught us, but that's not a proof. I, I gave you that stupid math example, right? How 5 into 25 goes 14 times. There's a fellow, uh, Bertrand Russell, wrote a two-page proof, two pages of mathematical explanation why 1 plus 1 equals 2. OK, I'll just take your word on it. 1 plus 1 equals 2. Are there absolute truths out there? Well, why does it matter? Because it does matter. Because if there's some things out there that are true absolutely, then they're what we call immutable. They're unchangeable. And we need to change the way we think if the truth matters to us. If the truth doesn't matter or the truth can be relative, then don't worry about it. However, you might find yourself in a situation where you wish you knew what the absolute truth was because you're standing in front of it. That's a possibility, something we can't absolutely prove. We believe. We believe it's true belief, but we have no way to absolutely prove it now. So are there absolute truths, relative truths? If there are or are not, why bother to search for the truth? So. The question today is, how important is the truth, people? I made this up about 3 o'clock this morning when I got up. How important is the truth? For example, reasons for telling the truth. One of the most important reasons you'll encounter in your whole life, falling in love. I couldn't ask for anyone more. Really? Don't you say that to all the ladies? I can't live life without you, baby. Really? Don't you say that to all the ladies. And we believe one another, don't we? And when we believe each other enough, we take the next step until death do us part. Because we believe they're telling the truth. And look, I'm using male as the example, but females are the same. We all enter into this together. 
And so we take the next step until death do us part. And that, that has implications that we believe so much in the love that we have for each other and the love we've expressed to each other that this love is true, capital T. And we're willing to commit the rest of our lives to it. It binds us together in such a way that it's irreversible. But then we find out that half of our marriages, at least, end in divorce. So what happened to until death do us part? I'm not being judgmental. I'm just examining the truth here of what we say, of what we believe, of what we say we know. Because if what you said turns out not to be true, but at the time it was, but it's not eternal, it doesn't last forever, it wasn't absolute, then half of you statistically are being raised by one parent and not the other. I adopted my daughter. Her dad walked out on her literally the night she was born. Jody was five when I adopted her. She had a difficult time with that. I was always that guy until she graduated high school. I said graduated, I meant graduated high school. Yeah. And it was a small private school. And at high school you could stand up and you could you know, kind of say what you wanted to to the group. So the group's out there and I'm over here and Jody's here and she's volleyball star at school. I want to thank my coach, I want to thank da 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 da. And for the first time in her life she looked at me and she said, and I want to thank my dad. Because I put up with her. Well, truth is she put up with me too. Finding the truth about a relationship takes work. And she and I are bonded together. We talk all the time. I'm her dad. In fact, I asked her husband one day, I said, you know, it was rough on Jody and I when we first started. I said, do you think she really got over it? He, he said, Larry, he, he said, she loves you with all her heart. You'll always be her dad. Out of a broken relationship where people promised and told the truth. How important is the truth? Isn't it important? Hmm. Yet it turns out in many situations it's not absolute, is it? I'm not judging, I'm not blaming, I'm just saying, so how, how important is the truth? The court. Tell the truth, the whole truth. I always have a problem with the whole part. I thought the truth was the whole truth, and then they want you to tell the whole truth. What are we talking about, people? Because the truth is important, right? Well, officer, honestly, what happened was, did I share this in class with you? I got busted for driving. I had a Porsche. You, those of you in ethics know this story. I got busted for driving a Porsche. I was having breakfast with my secretary over, got up on the highway, and this guy in a, in a Chevy tried to blow me off the highway, and I just and I got busted, slowing down. The officer pulled me over. That was 55 in the highway back in the first oil embargo, 55 all major US highways. And he busted me doing 87. And by the time he went through the little dance, you know, to figure this out, he got back in the car, he said, do you know how fast you were going? And I said, I have to assume that 87 and the, 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 uh, the, the speed gun belonged to me. I'm, I'm, I'm way out in front of the Chevy, Chevy's. Uh. I said, to be real honest, I said, I topped out at 127. You caught me slowing down. He gave me the weirdest look. Now, I should have gotten an 87 and a 55. He said, you know what? I'm going to give you a 75 and a 55. Now, I'm going to assume it's because I told the truth. Did I have to tell the truth? Well, 